Actually, I will talk about low molecular weight MR probes, and actually, as you will see, only on about one probe, really. Um, so, for uh, in, in, in oncology for tumor detection and also in developing drugs for treatment of tumors, vascularity is a key uh, issue and key uh, parameter to be targeted and to be uh, uh, um, and to be visualized to uh, in the diagnosis as well as in the treatment evaluation. So that can be assessed by um, small contrast agents and. Uh, the, the major contrast agent that is being used uh, both in the clinic and to some less extent also in animal studies is gadolinium uh, chelate. And you can assess that both by a T1, which is called dynamic contrast enhanced MRI, and by T2 star. Uh, and that's called dy dynamic susceptibility contrast uh, MRI. So the DC MRI, it's much more quantitative than the uh, dynamic susceptibility contrast MRI because it's very difficult to get good calibrations for the uh, signal changes that you, uh, you, you see there. So I will focus on, uh, on this DC MRI in the remainder of my talk. So this is a typical example. So um, this is a patient with, uh, with prostate cancer and the patient is being injected with uh, a bolus of gadolinium DTPA intravenously and after a while uh, dynamic MRIs are being taken. So T1 weighted MRIs are being taken and then you see uh, uh, signal changes over time in particular areas of the prostate more pronounced than in other areas and the tumorous areas tend to have higher enhancement by the contrast than the, uh, the normal prostate, prostate areas. So that's seen here. So the uptake here is in a particular voxel here in the tumorous areas and here in the normal, normal area. So the question is how do you quantitatively analyze uh, these, this data? And it can either be done by a non-model approach or by using a model approach. And a non-model approach, for instance, is making use of the area under the curve or the steepness of the curve here. And with proper calibrations, you can get values out of that uh, analysis that make clinically uh, that are clinically useful. So, but I will I will focus more on the model-based uh, approach. And why is that interesting? Because in this curve is also hidden uh, physiological information. Um, and that can be, for instance, sorry, that can be, for instance, uh, tumor blood flow might be in there, permeability of the vessel walls, um, microvascular density, interstitial space, and a few others. So it is of interest to see if we can come up with models that uh, uh, make, make uh, that allow us to uh, get information about these, uh, these uh, physiological parameters. So that has started about the, uh, the early 1990s. Various groups started developing these pharmacokinetic models, putting some of these variables in their models. And there was quite some confusion. And actually what happened is by, uh, by Paul Tofts and others, there, was, there were a few consensus meetings and they came up with a paper which was a key, which has, uh, which be, uh, became a key paper in this uh, in this uh, field, in which they standardized a lot of these quantities and also came up with a kind of generalized uh, model. So, and that is now uh, known as the Tofts or uh, Tofts Larsen model, and that's the model that's being widely used in uh, in um, in the evaluation of the dynamic contrast MRI. So you can find more about this uh, in this book uh, of uh, Jackson, Buckley, and, uh, and Parker, for instance, and uh, also a nice introduction or overview of this field is given by Furl and Port in this, uh, in this uh, review paper, which is more focusing on the quantification of antigenic uh, treatments, in which this, this approach is becoming, uh, is, uh, is very important now. So I will give an introduction in this uh, tofts larsen model and actually based on the classical uh, tracer kinetics which have been developed by Kitty and Schmidt already in the 50s. And it starts with, uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this situation with, um, with an, uh, two, compartment, two compartments, a vascular compartment and an vascular extracellular compartment. Um, so what 
What happens is that uh, gadolinium is injected intravenously and then enters, for instance, in, this, in the tissue via the arterial feeding, the, the feeding arterials. It is uh, entering the tissue and extravasates out, out, of the, out, out of the vessels in the interstitial space. But it doesn't enter the, uh, it can't enter the, uh, the cells, the tumor cells. Uh, this is different in the brain where you have the blood-brain barrier. So you in, the, in, in the brain you are entering a, a more limiting situation of these uh, pharmacokinetic uh, models where you, where you cannot have free uh, extravasation of the gadolinium uh, outside the vessels. So what happens then is then uh, the gadolinium is then entering the interstitial space and then um, there will be a rapid exchange of the water molecules with the gadolinium uh, compound. And uh, because of uh, the gadolinium is paramagnetic, you have a strong dipole-dipole interaction, which gives you a very efficient T1 relaxation. So what is also assumed in this model is that the, uh, the water exchange over the, the, the cell membrane is uh, very fast. It's not a limiting factor in, uh, in this process compared to the relaxation. I will come to that uh, uh, later in, uh, in my talk. Um, so what you want to do is then, then you want to derive from this um, signal changes induced by a gadolinium on the water signal, you want to derive the concentration of gadolinium. So that's an important thing. You're not directly looking at the uh, contrast agent, but you're looking at uh, the effect the contrast agent has on the water signal. So that's, that's, that complicates uh, the situation. So, but you can do that with, a co uh, with proper uh, calibrations. So now if we have that, uh, say we have that concentration of gadolinium, the question now is how do we model that? So there are, in the, in the TOFS model, there are a few uh, basic uh, building blocks from which the model is uh, constructed. So that obviously it is uh, blood flow here, that is the uh, concentration of the concentration in the, in the plasma, that is the concentration in the interstitial space. That is the permeability of, uh, of the vessel wall. That's the surface area of the vessel wall. And that is the um, vascular um, volume, the fractional vascular volume and the fractional uh, interstitial volume. So and all these contribute somehow to the uh, uptake rate, or somehow to the or a function of the, of the uptake rate. So whole blood, whole blood uh, tissue concentration, uh, permeability, vessel surface area, and a distribution volume over the extracellular uh, extravascular volume. So the uh, vessel volume actually is being ignored in this model. That is important because that's, uh, that may be violated in some applications of this model, but uh, uh, it, it, it's a real essential element of the model that uh, this uh, vessel uh, fraction doesn't contribute. So then the, the early model that was being uh, developed was uh, by, uh, by, uh, by, uh, by Larson already in the 1990s. And actually, so he derived this uh, differential uh, equation in which you have the concentration of the, uh, of the contrast agent uh, flow and uh, the uh, difference between the, uh, the uh, concentrat agent concentration in the vessels and in the interstitial space. And also in an extraction fraction. So the extraction fraction is actually the amount of contrast agent that is being taken up by the uh, tissue in the first pass of the contrast. So and that is given by this, uh, this expression here. So there are a few other assumptions being made in this uh, model. Uh, so uh, another important thing is that it is only valid for perfused areas. This is often also violated in the use of this model. So if you have necrotic areas or areas where they're not perfused, you cannot basically uh, uh, apply this model. So if you have an area where you analyze the uh, the vascularity by the TOFS model, then you have to take out the uh, necrotic areas to come up with, uh, with uh, uh, decent values. Another thing is, is that uniform prop properties per pixel are assumed, so that not necessarily has to be true. There are other models that don't include this, like a plug follow model, for instance, in, uh, in, in vessels. Um, and it also ignores the T1 effect of the contrast agent in the, uh, in the vessel. So the, essentially the concentration that is being evaluated is the contrast, concentration of the contrast agent in the interstitial space. 
and it ignores a few other things like uh, interstitial pressure. Um, so another uh, refinement of the of the early model by Larson was actually the, intro the inclusion of uh, of the hematocrit value. So to come with uh, an, um, an expression for a plasma flow. So you see that here in the expression or in also in the extraction uh, fraction. So this then leads immediately to limit a limiting situation. So I mean, what you would really like to know is something about flow or permeability. And that can be, uh, can be derived if you are, for instance, in a flow limited situation. So in a situation where you have, where the extravasation is very fast compared to the, to the flow. And then the extraction is one. So you have an immediate front of contrast agent which moves through the tissue. So that leads then to uh, this expression is essentially is actually what has Katie has derived uh, already in the 1990s for a diffusible uh, brain uh, uh, contrast uh, uh, media. So the other situation is, is that you have um, high flow and low permeability. And if you that then uh, uh, apply to these, uh, to these uh, expressions, to these different uh, expressions, then you get actually this expression for the extraction in the, uh, in the permeability limit, limited situation. So the, uh, this situation in which you have permeability limiting is originally der derived uh, by Baltovs for, um, for the brain. So that, that was his original model. And of course, that was due to the fact that you have the blood-brain barrier, which is difficult to pass by the uh, contrast uh, agent. So, and then in this paper in 1999, this consensus paper, the more general model was accepted. So the Tofts model. And that actually introduces a so-called uh, K-trans uh, uh, parameter, which is composed of these uh, uh, components here. And uh, it's called the volume transfer constant and actually says how the contrast agent is moving. It's kind of a flux. Uh, it's describing the flux of the contrast agent in and out of the, uh, of the vessels in the interstitial space. So you can then also um, uh, evaluate, um, derive that this is uh, equal to the product of the rate constant of the contrast agent over the, uh, mem of the vessel, uh, vessel wall and the uh, interstitial space. So and for this situation, you can also derive then a, a limiting situation, flow limited, in which this k trans is uh, more or less proportional to the flow and a permeability limit situation in which the k trans is uh, proportional to the permeability surface area. So that's what you want. You want to know these numbers, and that's why you are looking for uh, these limiting situations to, uh, to derive these uh, values or these parameters. <coughs> so the um, equation, the differential equation, can then be solved. And then you get this expression here in which you have the k trans and these rate constants kap. And uh, so you can then apply this in some way to your curves. You can fit your curves because you have the uh, contrast agent uh, change uh, here, and also you have the uh, and, and and also you have and that's a very important. I will come to that in a moment. You also, this input the uh, contrast uh, variation in the in the in the plasma. So the general MR protocol is, is that you measure a T1-weighted MR image after a bolus injection. So this is in patients, after, uh, which may last for about a few seconds. Then you have a rapid, usually gradient echo uh, sequence with a time resolution of uh, preferably of uh, uh, two to four seconds. This should, should be seconds, actually. And then, um, and then you should design your sequence such that you avoid artifacts, for instance, T2 star artifacts by uh, minimizing the echo time and the amount of contrast agents that you are using. Then, um, then you determine your signal change and you assume a linear relation with the, uh, with the uh, contrast agents to calculate the amount of gadolinium that you have in your, uh, your uh, voxel or pixel. It's, it's better if you have the possibility, for instance, by a snapshot flash or such a sequence to measure the T1 directly. So that avoids some kind of uh, calibration uh, issues that may, uh, may hamper your, your um, uh, Galim uh, contrast assessment. 
And then most Im a very important thing is that you have to determine this uh, uh, time varying contrast agent concentration in the vessels, the so-called arterial input function. And ideally, of course, that is from the, from in the case of a tumor, from a feeding uh, artery, but in practice that is uh, not really possible. So uh, you, may sam you may actually uh, probe vessels which are nearby, where are clo uh, so as close as possible to the, uh, to the, uh, to the target tissue. Um, that can be uh, can be problematic. So, oh, sorry, can be problematic, and uh, um, still for for all ki all kinds of reasons, and therefore uh, uh, in many cases a population-based uh, arterial input function is being used. But it has been demonstrated in, in, in several cases that an individual uh, assessment is uh, much better. And there you can. Okay. So essentially you measure two physiological variables, that's also good to realize. So you measure this K-trans or either the uh, interstitial space or the, uh, the rate constant K-AP. Uh, what you sometimes see is that actually these rate constants K-trans and K-AP are defined as unidirectional constants while actually they are uh, determining both the, the extravasation of concentration as well uh, from, the, from the vessels into the tissue as well from the tissue into the, to the, to the vessels. So the ideal thing of having these, um, these values for these parameters is that it should be independent from the observer, from the MR sequences, and from the from the scanner. Now, in reality, that is that is not the case. So, as usually in these situations, so you always have to calibrate your um, your uh, pharmacokinetics and your MR and uh, DCMRI uh, measurements uh, for your local situation. All kinds of variations may may influence this. So this is an example here of a patient with a head and neck tumor. Here you see the tumor before the contrast and after the contrast. And this is the, uh, this is the arterial input func function which has been probed from this artery here. So what uh, you can do, you can search for such an artery but you, and, and pixels in the artery. And the problem that you have is that you can have pulsations, T2 star effects and so forth. So another approach is uh, that we have introduced, but also others have done that in other ways, is by an automatic detection uh, pack a software package, which actually in our situation start with prior knowledge for how should this arterial input function look like. The K-trans, uh, the individual, uh, that you need individual arterial input functions is important because you see here that the K-trans can be very variable. Actually, these are values uh, from, the, from the prostate and what you see is that the majority of um, um, voxels in, in prostate cancer have a higher K-trans than in, um, in normal prostate uh, regions. But the, the, the all, all, uh, everything together, it's really uh, uh, very variable. And um, so given that it is quite kind of difficult to have this arterial input function um, in our institution, often a, a kind of calibration is actually being done. So it's not really a pharmacokinetic model, but more kind of calibration um, by looking, um, by searching for normal tissue in the prostate. And that's then used as your uh, calibration tissue. And that's of course kind of dangerous, but of course you really don't know if you are hitting tumor tissue without uh, realizing that. But that's a way of overcoming uh, this problem with this arterial input function. There are, there's a lot of research being done on how, how to uh, do that. And there, for instance, there's a group uh, uh, trying to look at phase changes instead of intensity changes, which uh, tends to avoid certain artifacts but introduces others. And then uh, what I just mentioned is uh, prostate health, prostate as a reference tissue, but you can also use other tissues as reference tissue. And uh, uh, what, for instance, has been introduced already many years ago is muscle as a reference tissue. But what you can see here is that actually the uptake in muscle is pretty low, so that may not be very accurate. Um, so this is an example of um, a patient study in which we looked at uh, carbogen breathing in the patients with uh, head and neck tumors. There is a slight increase in the uh, average uh, uh, rate constant, but it was in this case not really uh, significant. In other cases we had more uh, with drug treatments, for instance, you can have very significant changes in these uh, rate constants. 
which tell you something about the uh, vascularity, the effect of the uh, drug on the vascularity. So, given that we have these two parameters, which not really, which are kind of lump parameters about the physiological parameters that we are interested in, we initially asked ourselves what is actually determining these uh, these uh, these parameters. Is that flow permeability, the surface area, or the uh, interstitial space? So. You can test that in, uh, in, um, in animals, for instance, in a brain tumor in, uh, in the rat. And this is, uh, here you can see the tumor here. Uh, and then that's actually the, uh, an image taken one minute after the contrast, uh, gallium contrast uh, application. And then you, what you can, and the nice thing of the brain is that you can really, again, the matching is quite, quite nice there compared to other tissues. And then you can do immunohistology uh, of that uh, of that brain. And then you can get uh, so what you see here is the result of the immunohistology. So here the vessels. So you can determine here the vessel density. Uh, you can determine the, the surface areas. All kinds of things you can determine by uh, by the by the histology. Um, and then you can from the tumor you get the uptake uh, rate constant KAP in this case. Um, so what has been done is, for instance, vessel counts and, uh, and surface area has been determined. And then what turned out is that actually surface area was best related with the uh, uptake rate constant. What's also important to note that this was of the perfused vessel. So very, what you often see in the literature is that people try to correlate vessel density with, uh, with uh, 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 dynamic contrast uh, parameters. And, uh, and, if, and that may not be really looking very good, but if you go to the, the pure perfused vessels, are of course the vessels that really are correlated with your uh, contrast agent uptake. So this is another evaluation of, uh, of the data and simulation of the relationship between the, uh, the uptake rate constant, the permeability surface area, and the flow, uh, taking a number of uh, 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 realistic values into, or uh, ranges <coughs> into account. And um, so this is uh, plotted up here in a three-dimensional plot. So you see here the flow, the uh, permeability surface area, and here the uptake rate constant. And what we saw just that we had a linear relationship between um, the uh, uptake rate constant and the permeability surface area. And actually from this uh, three-dimensional plot, you can uh, conclude that uh, we are in a regime in which the flow is dominating over the, uh, uh, the permeability. So that is a permeability limited uptake, what we are looking here at. Another uh, experiment was with uh, carbogen. So carbogen has uh, CO2 and it has an vascular effect. It should really uh, get uh, uh, de vessel dil dilatation. Um, but what we actually saw was the opposite. What we expected is what we see here is actually this is the uptake of the gallium in air, and this is in the presence of carbogen, see a strong reduction of the uptake of the, of the gadolinium. So that can be, uh, if we are in a permeability limited situation, you can uh, expect, for instance, that the permeability is decreased, that you have a decreased surface area or an increase of the extracellular uh, space. So you can do other kinds of experiments or argue that neither of these effects is, uh, uh, is really, uh, is really of, of importance. And uh, therefore, it's more relevant to look at a uh, flow-limited situation. And in, that, uh, in, that, in this expression here, the reduction in the uptake rate constant would mean a reduction in flow. And that's what you commonly see in these kinds of subcutaneous tumors, is that with uh, carbon breathing, you get a kind of steel effect, is that actually the uh, vasodilatation of the host vessels, but restriction of the vessel, uh, vessel diameter in, uh, in the tumors. So, um, if you so, uh, this actually I, I'm just talking about these experiments a little bit um, to show you that actually in tumors you are a little bit on the brink of flow limited and permeability limited. So, if you really want to go, want to know one of these parameters, you have to choose another uh, another approach. For instance, if you want to know the permeability, you can choose for a contrast agent that is large and that not so easily gets out of the vessels. And such a contrast agent is, uh, is for instance, gadolinium 70, which has a larger molecular weight than, uh, than gadolinium. 
So that uh, so that's what we all also studied uh, in uh, in uh, in various tumors in brain tumors growing subcutaneously in an, uh, in a mouse in this situation. And what you here have is an homogeneously perfused tumor, but an homogeneous level of uh, of rate co of the rate constants, and here more ho heterogeneous. So this was done by measuring the T1 directly with a snapshot flash uh, uh, measurement, which gives you direct T1s instead of that you have to derive them from a uh, two-point two measurement, as is commonly done. What also sh show this heterogeneous T also shows that the histogram analysis is very advantage in uh, in in uh, in this uh, situation. So if you would add everything together, uh, analyze the tumor as a whole then all these various uh, differences uh, dis may disappear. So um, in many tumors, um, the, the, ves the vessel size, the vessel fraction may be uh, actually rather low, or maybe not, uh, sorry, may not, may, may be much larger than the, the, the model actually allows you to, uh, to evaluate. So, uh, and we just, I, I just told you this one of the uh, early assumptions of the model was that we ignored the uh, vascular fraction. So we're with studying larger, other tumors with larger vessels, vessel fractions, it, it, it became uh, needed to introduce also an, uh, an, uh, an, <coughs> an component here, which in, in, includes this, uh, this uh, vascular uh, fraction, vascular uh, VP here. So now you have, an, and you introduce an additional uh, parameter, and that makes, of course, th th and then you have the need, of course, that you need better time resolution and also better uh, signal to noise and contrast to noise. So that's the, 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 the issue that uh, in, in, the, in, 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 ex in extending uh, your, your models with more parameters. So a critical review of, um, of, the, of the scope and interpretation of the uh, TOFT mos model is uh, given by uh, So Bron and, uh, and Buckley uh, in MRM in 2012, and so what they concluded actually from this was a, it's a mathematical evaluation of the of the model, and what they concluded actually that's only applicable the Stoff model if the blood volume component is small. And, uh, but that's also true for this extended uh, TOFS model. And here you can also uh, make use of the model if you have a high blood flow. So if you don't uh, are in these, um, in, in these situations, then you may end up with a nice fit, but then the uh, variables that you get out of there, the values that you get out of may not have physiological sense, or the fits may not be uh, as nice as you would like to have. So more uh, recently, actually, with the, in, with the increase of the quality of the MR machines and the higher time resolutions, people are trying to now directly uh, estimate the permeability surface area and the uh, vascular flow from a dynamic contrast uptake. So now you, so this is an overview here of um, all kinds of models that has been, have been explored in, uh, for dynamic contrast uh, MRI. And uh, so here you have, for instance, you have the extended uh, uh, TOS model, but you can go to a model in which you have actually four parameters that you, uh, that you can, uh, can, uh, can fit. And so that not only requires a higher time resolution, but also <laughs> obviously carries the, the, the risk of, uh, of overfitting. So what uh, the group of Buckley actually proposes a kind of data-driven model selection. So among all these models that are available, you can make a some kind of model uh, tree and start at the bottom here with the simple models and then go upwards and then see if the model uh, starts to fit your data better and also significantly better than a, than a lower model and then that would be then the ideal model to fit your, uh, fit your data. Other approaches are that you more focus on particular area of the uptake curve, but for instance, the first, pa first part of the uptake curve in which you assume that the, uh, uh, that the, uh, that the flow, uh, that the transit time is not too fast, so that actually you, you're mostly looking at, at, at uh, extravasation, at, at, at uh, extravasation of the contrastation in the, in the tissue, and then you uh, mostly get a uh, flow compartment uh, flow uh, uh, parameter out of that. Another point is, uh, which has been uh, criticized, particularly by Charlie Springer's group, is that water exchange may not be 
in a fast exchange limit. So what has so here we, what you see is the the exchange of water in the in the solar compartment and in interstitial compartment, and this exchange may be actually or the actually the the the, the relaxation by the contrast agent may, may be competing with this exchange. So at a certain moment, this exchange may be become rate limiting, and then you you need to introduce that in your your model, and that's what they did. Uh, so there are some, some interesting results out there. So what they do is actually is, uh, define a water lifetime related to this, this exchange. And that is an independent parameter that in these studies seem to show very interesting relationships to the malignancy of, uh, in this case, the breast or in the, the prostate cancer. But the number of patients are still very limited. And obviously, if you introduce an extra parameter, is this the parameter? This is the, is this 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 uh, water lifetime, or may this really represent some other physiological phenomena that you are fitting here? So, some finally some further uh, considerations. <coughs> so, often high spatial resolution is uh, required, especially especially if you need to uh, want to uh, assess other additional parameters from your model. And it may be in, in conflict uh, with uh, high spatial res uh, or, uh, uh, or the high temporal resolution may in conflict with your high spatial resolution. Um, so what what we do and what, what many others are doing is that you the different parts of the abduct curve are uh, sampled with different time and spatial resolutions with hybrid sequences. What is very important, which I didn't discuss, is that in drug uh, treatment assessment, reproducibility of your method is very important, and that should be a standard feature of, uh, of such an uh, assessment. Um, in, in routine patient uh, uh, assessment, it may be that you don't really want to go into these pharmacokinetic models, but you want to go to into model-free parametric uh, approaches, like the area under the curve, which I already addressed initially. Um, it, in animal studies, it may be more easier to go for larger contrast agents when you, and for permeability uh, assessments, and then direct T1 measurements are then possible uh, in some, in most of the in, in many cases. Um, there's also an issue about bolus and continuous infusion, which I won't discuss here. Um, and of course, obviously, a lot, a lot of the assumptions that we make may not be correct, just like uh, the hemocrete uh, values may be different in different uh, capillaries. And uh, so that may also have be, have be of influence of the outcome of, uh, of uh, TOS model analysis. So finally, to conclude, kinetic modeling DCMR provides important information on prognosis and treatment. And treatment. In, uh, in particular in cancer models, and it links the MR measures with physiological parameters. Um, so we have, the, thanks to this paper of uh, TOFs and colleagues, standard quantities and symbols, which are widely being used. It is already demonstrated an invaluable tool in, uh, in drug treatment assessments, for instance, in angiogenic treatments. Uh, however, due to a number of uncertainties and assumptions in the model, the results should be interpreted with, uh, with some caution, in particular if you want to make physiological conclusions from uh, out of your data. So, and finally, model is a line that helps you see the truth. Thank you very much.